Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you. My name is Tony Silberman, and I have the privilege of serving as vice chair of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. Au nom de la Fondation, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. As we gather tonight, we would like to acknowledge that we do so on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga peoples. It gives me great pleasure now to once again call upon the indefatigable James Pasternak, Toronto City Councillor for Ward 10 York Centre, to bring greetings. A member of council since his election in 2010, Councillor Pasternak is currently vice chair of the North York Community Council, chair of the Community Development and Recreation Committee. He sits as a member of the Budget Committee and serves on the board of directors of the Toronto Centre for the Arts. And in his spare time, it's through his generosity that he has given us this space. Much gratitude to you, Councillor Pasternak. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction, and it is truly a pleasure to be here once again to welcome everybody to, to City Hall. There are many members of the clergy here today, and I welcome you, some political representatives, community leaders, all people who have a vital voice in this conversation. Urbanization, diverse cultures, economic stress, world geopolitical issues. These are all major topics of conversation that can enter into the importance of an event like this. And when we develop and when we grow cities like Toronto, there is a reason why people from all over the world want to settle here, why they come from conflict zones, why they come from so many countries. Our principles of an independent judiciary, a free press, the rule of law, human rights code, charter, anti-discrimination policy. These are part of the tenets and responsibilities of government, the part that we must do here as elected representatives to make sure that civility leads to tolerance and restraint. Those are some of the core values that we cherish here at the City of Toronto. There, are, there, is, a, there is a reason why um, diversity remains uh, our strength, and it is much more than a slogan. It is a commitment from all of us that we know that we will always have differences, that we will always uh, have points of view uh, that may provoke uh, passion, but we always know that at the end of the day that we can argue, we can debate, but our restraint will always make us the envy of the world. I commend the organizers of this conversation that will be going to other cities. I commend the, the, um, the foundation and the great work that they are doing. Because as long as we keep talking, as long as we keep sharing ideas, we will truly be a cherished society, a society that people envy, a society that we can call our own. And that is why we were so lucky to be here uh, in Toronto, uh, in Canada, and carrying on in our own individual lives is a great place to raise a family, to start a business, and to grow and to grow in, into uh, into our local neighborhoods. And with that, I know that the uh, panelists here have uh, I've looked at the the backgrounds, the biographies, uh, an actual treasure trove of of, uh, of background that can add to this conversation and the experience. And I know that from many of the people that I've met here, many of the people who I know, they too will add to this important conversation. So in just summarizing, I thank you so much for coming to City Hall in a democratic institution in the heart of downtown Toronto to hold this meeting. I think you're doing fantastic work and I think you're setting a remarkable example. So thank you once again for the opportunity to, to share a few words, to welcome every here on behalf of the mayor and my fellow councillors, and I look forward to a very valuable conversation. Thanks again. Thank you, Councillor Pasternak, for your ongoing support, your ongoing concern, and we look forward to a very long and productive association with you. You're on notice. 
Created as part of the Japanese-Canadian Redress Agreement, the Canadian Race Relations Foundation Act was passed in 1990 and proclaimed in 1996, and I quote, to facilitate throughout Canada the development, sharing, and application of knowledge and expertise in order to contribute to the elimination of racism and all forms of racial discrimination in Canadian society. No small task. A Crown Corporation, one of the portfolio agencies of Citizenship and Immigration Canada, the foundation operates at arm's length from the government. It also has registered charitable status and donations are always welcome. Since it first opens its doors in November of 1997, it, the staff and board of directors of the foundation have been working diligently to situate the foundation as a national resource and facilitator to contribute to the strengthening of Canadian identity as it relates, among other things, to the principles of equality, social cohesion, and the promotion of harmonious race and ethnic relations. Our focus is on the advancement of effective and positive race relations, inclusion and belonging, outreach to youth, promotion of civic responsibility, and collaboration with all stakeholders, such as government agencies, private sectors, and community organizations. This important roundtable is being held on this date, not coincidentally. It represents the convergence of commemorations for three remarkable people. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the most influential and iconic leaders of the civil rights movement. Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat and Canada's first honorary citizen, who almost single-handedly saved more than 100,000 souls from perishing in the Holocaust. And Lincoln Alexander, the foundation's inaugural chair, a statesman of great dignity, a man before his time who defined his time, who broke racial barriers in his daily life, his career, and public service. Each one of them evidenced the power of one, but also the wisdom to engage the collective. Through their Herculean efforts, they demonstrate that those with compassion to care and the courage to act can transform history. And so here we are, and why you're here. The Canadian Race Relations Foundation is undertaking a six city roundtable series under the banner, The Urban Agenda, Race Relations and Multiculturalism in Canadian Cities. The discussions involving policymakers, community and thought leaders will both celebrate the individual and collective successes of Canadian citizen, citizen, cities as hubs of diversity and models of inclusion while also exploring issues that remain unresolved and identifying the challenges that are emerging. Our first stop, the big launch, is here, right now, in Toronto. And why Toronto? Many cities have defining, established, pride-based mottos. Toronto's is diversity our strength. Coined in 1998 when the city was amalgamated, this motto pays tribute to the fact that Toronto, the most populous city in Canada, enjoys a cosmopolitan and international population that makes it one of the world's most diverse cities by percentage of non-native born residents. The motto also suggests commitment to equity, respect, harmony, and even prosperity. Diversity is our strength. By acknowledging it, by practicing it, we make our cities a vital place to live, to attract, retain, and maximize the skills of all. But diversity is more than a numbers game. It must be appropriately measured, maintained, encouraged, and nurtured. And as we all know, it presents its fair share of challenges, stresses, and strains. And that's why you're here. We want to hear from you, panel and audience alike, as to what we as residents, engaged citizens, as policymakers, as thought leaders, have done right, and more importantly, what we can do better. 
We are delighted to have such a broad plethora of, of individuals with such broad experiences gathered tonight to listen, to discuss, to contribute, and to help us move forward. We are proud of the work we do and are honored by your willingness to work with us and engage in nurturing the kind of Canada in which we all want to live. Our efforts are hopefully built on shared values and a passionate belief in the principles of freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Nous sommes fiers du travail dans lequel nous sommes engagés et nous sommes honorés par votre volonté de vous joindre à la conversation. Nous vous en remercions sincèrement. It is now my pleasure to introduce your moderator for the Toronto Roundtable, Raoul Bardwaj, President and CEO of Toronto Foundation, who will introduce the topic, the process, and the panelists. Mr. Bardwaj's thesis-length curriculum represents a gentleman who has heeded and in most instances has initiated the clarion call to action and has been formally recognized for his extraordinary efforts. I encourage you to read his full bio and recognize why we are so pleased that he will be moderating tonight's session. Ladies and gentlemen, please kindly turn off your cell phones and fasten your seat belts. Thank you very much, Tony, and congratulations to CRRF for initiating a very important conversation across Canada and for including Toronto as a very natural starting point for that conversation. So we're going to be here tonight to listen to some wonderful uh, panelists speak about diversity in our great city. We're going to be having some presentations and we're going to have some conversations around some of their comments. And then of course we want to, in the spirit of inclusion and why we're here, include our audience in that conversation as well. So a little bit later on, um, as we get through the explanations and the conversations, there will be a Q&A session and we're going to encourage you to, uh, to join into that conversation. Um, as we get into that, there is a microphone right at the very front at a table. And for those who are unable to come there or do not want to, uh, please raise your hand. We do have a microphone and we'll have one circulating for those that want to answer or ask some questions. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can tell, the tickle is still in the throat. Um, Tonight we're really blessed <coughs> excuse me, to have three wonderful panelists with us tonight. Um, I'm going to be introducing them a little bit more formally as we get into it, but Dr. Wendy Suke from Ryerson University, we have Nathan Chiang from United Way, and of course Michael Adams from Enveronics. And this evening, we are going to start off with uh, Dr. Wendy Sukier, who's going to come up and uh, give us a little bit of her presentation on her findings and give you a little bit of background. She's currently the Vice President of Research and Innovation at Ryerson University. Um, I think many of you know of her by reputation, and I believe her, her bio is a part of the material circulated. But a couple of things I wanted to highlight. She's the founder of the Diversity Institute. She's also been the leader of an initiative called Diversity Leads, and she's been a part of the principal investigation group around that. So knows this area very well. But perhaps one of the not so well-known uh, facts about her is she's been recognized as one of 25 transformational Canadians by no less than the Globe and Mail, La Presse, and CTV. So I know that we'll be looking forward to her insights. It's all over to you, Wendy. Thanks very much, Raul. Just want to get the technology sorted. Is there a clicker? A clicker. Okay. Great. And I have my cell phone because as a faculty member, I'm used to talking in three hour blocks. I have a stopwatch, which will keep me on time. I wanted uh, tonight, first of all, to, uh, to thank the, um, the organizers for being here. The uh, Canadian Centre, the Canadian Race Relations Foundation uh, does amazing work. We're really lucky that the City of Toronto has agreed to host this. And uh, given who's in the room, I'm extremely honoured to have been given the opportunity to speak. I will uh, try to keep my remarks uh, 
at a very high level, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the research that we've done at the uh, Diversity Institute, much of it with people in the audience and on the panel, um, and some of those results. Talk a little bit about the business case for diversity as we see it from the city's uh, perspective and why it's important. Talk also about some of the success stories we have and our view on um, how you can use uh, the process of social innovation to help move this forward. So the Diversity Institute does research, as do many institutes, but it's fairly unique in the sense that it has a real action orientation, and the focus is really on informing practice and policy at the organizational um, level in particular, and Ratna Ahmedvar from the Maitri Foundation has recently joined us at Ryerson, and many of you are familiar with her work, which is also um, connected to our work. So a couple of studies, Diversity Leads, which grew out of the Diversity Counts project, uh, which was joint between Maitri and, and Civic Action. I'll just put this up because I think it addresses a couple of really important points when we look at issues of diversity and representation at the most senior levels uh, of the GTA. What this study did was look at um, six sectors, elected officials, government, agencies, boards and commissions, private sector, educational sector, and um, the voluntary sector, largest organizations in each, and it looked at representation at the boards as well as among executives. Uh, we looked at gender and we looked at racialized minorities. Um, and there are reasons why we looked at those two groups and not others, not that we don't think that diversity is, is broader than that. What I wanna draw your attention to are a couple of things. One is um, underrepresentation of women, underrepresentation of racialized minorities is still an issue in every single sector. And remember that in Toronto, approximately half of the population are racialized minorities and approximately half of the population um, are women. So you can see that the representation of women in senior roles is closer to 50%. Um, than uh, the representation of racialized minorities. You can also see from this there are huge disparities. So while in education and in government and among elected officials and the public sector, the uh, numbers are are much higher, we see that the corporate sector really lags quite far behind. The other point that's important, as I said, is that racialized minorities are really underrepresented, and if you intersect gender and racialization, what you will see is even though in this city, for every white woman, there is a racialized woman, white women outnumber racialized women in leadership roles by almost six to one. And why I think this is a pro an issue, and some of you are probably involved in the uh, recent changes to the Ontario Securities Commission comply or explain legislation that will govern boards. Why this is an issue is because if all we focus on is one dimension of diversity, if we only look at gender, we're not really going to address some of the issues of underrepresentation. The other important point about this research, in addition to these gaps between different sectors, are the differences within sectors, okay? So we very often hear when we're, we're discussing issues of representation on boards or at senior levels, that there is a problem with the pool. There aren't enough well-qualified women. There aren't enough well-qualified racialized minorities, even though we know that on average immigrants to Toronto are better educated than native-born um, citizens. But what the analysis within each of these sectors shows is huge gaps, okay? So take, for example, corporate boards of directors. Some organizations have more than 40% of their slots, and these are the largest businesses, uh, headquartered in Toronto. Some organizations have more than 40% of their board slots devoted to women, and 40%, sorry, over 30% of them have zero. We like to refer to those as the corporate zeros. But it's important to recognize that that is strong evidence to suggest the problem is not the pool, and you'll see the same thing with, uh, with racialized minorities. 
Another issue that we're interested in are the categories. And while we have done a lot of work looking at the experiences of racialized minorities and uh, and um, others, what we have found is that the category of visible minority or racialized minority conceals very important differences within the category. So while you can show there are, there are concrete differences between people self-identifying as racialized in the workplace versus people who identify as white Caucasian, definite gaps that need to be addressed, if you unpack the category of racialized minority or visible minority, you also see big differences among that category. So in this particular study, we looked at, um, this was a study that was done in Peel, and we looked at close to 1,500 um, individuals who were immigrants and their experiences. And what we found was there were big differences in the reported experience of discrimination, for example, if you compared the experience of, for example, Chinese immigrants to black immigrants or to South Asian and Filipino immigrants, if you, if you can see on the chart. Okay, so those differences are critically important. We're building on this work with Environics, the United Way, um, and others in the Black Experience Project, and I won't talk about that because Michael will go into more detail. But again, within the category of people self-identifying as black, you will see big differences between people born in Canada, not born in Canada, people of African origin versus people from the Caribbean. We did a study with the um, Herbal Alliance on Race Relations, where we looked specifically at homeless black youth um, who were LGBT, and we also looked specifically at Somali youth. And we found, again, intersectionality was really important. The issue of homelessness, for example, um, shapes people's experience in very fundamental ways. Similarly, the Somali youth reported uh, stigma and discrimination that wasn't just associated with the color of their skin, but also with their religion. We've done studies on Muslim women, for example, and again, these intersections between gender and race are important. I know Nation is going to speak about it in more detail, but I think the other piece of this that's critically important in the GTA is the intersection between socioeconomic status and these other factors. The social capital that many young people bring to their job searches, to their education, to their plans is very different depending on what their home circumstances are, what the conditions of their family are. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I was on a panel with a woman who was one of the first uh, um, black women who entered the University of Ottawa Law School and she did very well. She was from Scarborough and she talked about how in her third year of studying law, the dean of the school called up and said, last night was the deadline for applications to clerk at the Supreme Court of Canada. Her reply was, my mother was a medical secretary. I went to law school so I didn't have to be one. She didn't understand the difference between a clerk at the Supreme Court and a clerk who works in an office. And I can identify with that. I grew up in a family where my mother was a secretary. There were no professionals. I found what, what an engineer was after I had a master's degree and was working beside one. I thought they were the guys at the back of the train you waved at, at the crossways. So I just want to underscore that there's good research evidence to support the importance of these factors. We know the data, um, you've got the vital signs reports and others that these factors uh, intersect with education, with employment outcomes, with health outcomes. I'm on the board of, the, uh, of Women's College Hospital. Tons of evidence that suggests that socioeconomic factors as well as diversity factors impact access to health and health outcomes. We also know that media representation plays a profound role, not just in terms of who we see as leaders, who we see as experts, who is presented in the stories, how the stories are presented, but we know that that has a big impact on shaping our values. And we've done a number of studies that look both at who's behind the camera 
and who is in front of the camera in both print and broadcasting. And again, you see lots of issues around representation that shape who people see as leaders, who people see as experts, and um, influence the aspirations of young people. So the media plays a particular role in who we see and also how we, how we see the issues. And this has been especially important in, uh, in recent days. How, for example, um, people and, um, and uh, incidents are framed is very much affected by assumptions that can then influence bias and, and prejudice. I think uh, we're preaching to the converted, but the perspective that we take at the Diversity Institute is that um, a commitment to diversity is grounded in human rights, equity, and, and fairness as well as law. But there are actually very good reasons from um, the point of view of enlightened self-interest to get this right. We know that all employment growth in the next um, coming years will uh, be a result of immigration. We know from reports that have been done by the Toronto Board of Trade that the underemployment of immigrants is costing the region not millions but billions of dollars. We know that many sectors are screaming about the talent shortage. You have this phenomena of people without jobs, jobs without people, a huge mismatch um, that is um, impacting our economic development as well as our social development. We also know that uh, as markets become increasingly diverse, both within the city and globally, that having a diverse workforce can enhance uh, the success of organizations. We know that diversity is linked to innovation and creativity. Lots of, lots of data that supports that. We know that immigrants are overrepresented among entrepreneurs. We know that small, medium enterprises are drivers of economic development. And we know that getting this right is critically important in terms of mitigating legal and reputational costs. So there's very good solid evidence that reinforces the business case for diversity, whether you're talking about the city and the region, whether you're talking about a bank, whether you're talking about a hospital or a university. Won't go into detail, but one of the other things we've spent some time on is trying to evaluate and identify success stories and best practices. Uh, TRIAC is one of the sort of gold standard examples of success. I was also talking to uh, Ratna and some others about some of the projects we've had in the city of Toronto, at least as far as uh, I recall, that have been aimed at advancing inclusion. How many of you remember Operation Lifeline, which was aimed at resettling uh, refugees from Indochina? It's interesting because if you think about that, that was one of the almost iconic examples of people coming together from diverse backgrounds in order to address a really pressing problem. And if you look at the success stories of many of the people who came to Canada um, in 79 and 80 as a result of that program, there are lots of really good um, models that we can consider. And in fact, uh, Ratna is currently looking with others at how to adapt that to this current Syrian refugee crisis. And as a city of immigrants and a country of immigrants and the children of immigrants, I think addressing these issues together is critically important. We've got lots of examples of success stories. Don't need to go through them. Some are in the room of people who've been trailblazers. So in spite of the barriers that we know from the data exist, we have shining examples of people who have risen to the top. And one of the key areas for our research is understanding what factors have helped them succeed. Because while it's important to recognize the structural barriers and the impediments and the problems of racism and discrimination, it's also important to figure out strategies to get around those barriers, to get over those barriers, and to succeed in spite of those barriers while at the same time trying to erode them. And I pulled this because it, it's always been uh, trying to do strip school board. Yes, that's the right acronym. It's always been striking to me every year when Toronto, uh, usually it's the star, publishes the top scholars from the Toronto District School Board, and you read their bios. The majority 
are almost always racialized minorities and immigrants. Again, stories of success and leaders of tomorrow. So when we think about the way forward, I think there's no question people understand collaboration is critical. I think there's no question that people understand that a multi-sector approach is important and that we have to think about this issue from a societal level, from an organizational level, and from an individual level if we're going to drive um, change forward to promote inclusion and success. And I just wanted to end, this is a bit off script, but I just wanted to end. Yesterday I was speaking at an event at uh, the city of Montreal in honor of uh, Martin Luther King Day. And I do think it's critically important, particularly at this time in our history, to remember that extremism is not restricted to any group, to remember that the, um, the uh, beliefs and the actions that underline virulent racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, um, homophobia, and misogyny, etc. all the isms and the phobias that we're trying to fight are very similar and that we really have to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wendy. And now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Nathan Chung, who's the Director, Youth Initiatives of United Way. Just a little bit of background on Nathan, who was born in Guyana, but he's quite an accomplished Torontonian now. And I read something new about Nation, uh, Nation in his bio as well. Uh, a community worker by profession, musician by vocation, and artist by compulsion. Nation is interested in everybody and everything he's curious to know seeking to overstand and eager to share. So I'm quite looking forward to Nation's remarks as well. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be here. My, my remarks will be short. Um, I, I, I think the richness of this evening is in the dialogue, so I'll keep my remarks as brief as possible. Um, I hope to focus a little bit on my experience and perspective working with youth over the last 15 years. Um, also being a father of a 25 and a 24 year old uh, struggling in the 21st century, that I, I think that gives me a little bit of perspective um, and being a young parent myself. Um, diversity. Diversity in its most ideal sense equals a cultural shift. It challenges our concepts of power, privilege, entitlement. It demands sensitivity. It demands openness. Um, it demands our ability to challenge our assumptions, the ones that we are aware of and the ones that we have yet to be aware of. Diversity is not anti-oppression. It's not anti-racism. Um, and there are many debates out there in the community about where those two movements, thoughts, um, intersect and where they, they differ. I would suggest there is room for the, uh, conversations around diversity, which this forum represents, and there's also room for uh, the specificity of an, uh, an anti-racism dialogue. We have many encouraging changes um, here in Toronto and uh, the speakers before me have laid it out that we have a lot to celebrate, that this is indeed a wonderful city. I've traveled in many places across the world and met many, many young people and I can say to you without question that I always feel good coming home. We can see efforts made um, within Toronto community housing, taking for example the most recent diversity scholarship creating opportunities for young people to go on to post-secondary education. I know that institutions like the Toronto Police Services um, have advanced in a diversity agenda to be more inclusive of, inclusive of visible minorities and women. We have the provincial stepping up framework that identifies barriers that young people face and is intentional and, and challenges community service organizations, employers and educators to address the inequities that young people, um, young people face in our communities in the areas of education and employment. 
We have the Maytree and Civic Action. We have Diversity Fellows. We have United Way's Youth Challenge Fund. And we have things like the Gay and Straight Alliance movement among, in schools as demonstrations of the power and the empowerment of um, organizations, individuals, and our young people. At the heart of this, I would suggest transformation sits uh, in our ability to build capacity. In our ability to build capacity in individuals, in institutions, in communities, and families. I'll reflect a little bit on my experience with the Youth Challenge Fund as what one might categorize an investment in diversity and leadership in, here in Toronto. So the Youth Challenge Fund was born um, in response to uh, a significant amount of violence in 2005 that culminated in the death of Jane Kriba on Young Street. And it was acknowledged at the time that there were significant issues uh, amongst young people living in inner city, in inner city neighborhoods um, that were centered in education, employment, that made those individuals most vulnerable to uh, victims of violence or perpetrators of violence. So the Youth Challenge Fund made an effort to invest in those communities, invest in those young people with the belief that if you invest in young people and give them the opportunity that they will generate the ideas that are relevant to their peers and their communities, and with the right supports, actualize those ideas and implement change in community. I would say we were successful to a degree. Uh, the jury's out. One of the things that is an emergent and concrete lesson coming out of five years of work and investment in community is the importance of building capacity. And this is the, this is the complexity of this, uh, this conversation around diversity. And I love that um, it's been stated that it is more than a numbers game. It has to be more than a numbers game. Um, it has to be an intentional effort and I'll keep focused on youth, it has to be an intentional effort of asking ourselves what needs to be true for the individuals to have the capacity to step into organizations, systems that previously did not welcome them, and what has to be true for the institutions and the systems that are welcoming those organizations that creates the most optimal conditions of success for those young people. I term, I term that as capacity building. How do we build capacity amongst our young people across cultures to step into leadership? And how do we build capacity within our organizations, whether it is in this, gr in, in this great hallway, whether it is in the, the boardrooms of our foundations, or whether it is at community tables um, where community members come together to affect change. This room represents our progress in many ways, and I'm glad that we have both educators, public figures, labor, community leaders, because the diversity agenda and transformation in diversity in the deepest sense depends on each and every one of us in this room. I was moved by the photo that was shared about the TDSB graduates, and I think that this begins to unpack or flesh, um, flesh out the complexity of this conversation of diversity. So when we look at the images of those um, high school graduates, indeed, they are racialized individuals. But in the paradigm of racism and oppression, there are no young people of African descent. There are no black, in, black youth within those pictures. There are no black youth, there are no Aboriginal youth within those pictures. There are no Latino youth in those pictures. And those figures um, tell us that those are, the, those are the young people that are most affected and are, are most vulnerable in our community. So I point that out because it's easy to get caught up in this idea of representation by color representation by sexual orientation, representation by all the intersectionalities that the previous speaker alluded to. What we are challenged to do is think beyond just representation, because representation does not challenge us to think of class and where those who are often in um, impoverished communities um, based on a plethora of reasons, including education, employment, and access networks and relationships are left out of the conversation of diversity. But of course, 
if we look at the picture of who's graduating and the top graduates, we can easily celebrate and clap and say, yes, we are a diverse community. I would suggest for the purpose of this conversation that the true and deep meaning of diversity, if we are not ready to talk about anti-racism and anti-oppression, that if indeed we are attempting to utilize diversity as a platform to have these conversations in more quote-unquote civilized conversations that are a little more comfortable for folks, because the word anti-racism still makes us uncomfortable. It requires introspection. It requires reflection. It requires overcoming of guilt to get to solutions. If indeed we are going to talk about diversity, the extent to which diversity influences and fosters transformation amongst those who are most marginalized in our communities. The man who I walked up seeing on Bay Street on the way here in an old TTC discarded jacket, digging through garbage, looking for food, when diversity affects that individual, then I think we are having a deep and meaningful conversation about diversity. When diversity, when the graduation rate, uh, picture of 2016 or 2017 represents Afro-diasporic young people who are now represent the highest dropout rates, or Aboriginal young people, or Latino-speaking young people, then we have a lot to celebrate. We indeed, indeed do live in a wonderful city, and we have come a long way. I would suggest to you we have a very long way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nation. And our, <coughs> excuse me, our third speaker tonight is uh, our dear friend Michael Adams. And Michael, as many of you might know, is the president and founder of the Enveronics Institute for Survey Research. He's the author of six books, a noted commentator on social values and social change in North America. He's among the 100 most influential people in Canadian communications, and in 2009, he got his honorary doctorate from Ryerson University and knows Toronto extremely well. So please welcome Michael Adams. Well, thank you, Rahul, and uh, it's really an honor to be sharing a panel with these two distinguished uh, uh, panelists, uh, it's great to be in City Council, and uh, all my friends are in City Council. I didn't know you all got elected to City Council. Uh, well, we've been told to be brief, and I, I think it's appropriate because there's a lot of expertise in this room. I know looking around there are people who have deep knowledge about the things that uh, Nation and Wendy and I are, are talking about today. and. Uh, when I reflect on the book I wrote in 2006 called Unlikely Utopia, um, it was a bit of a cheeky title, I admit. Um, irony is, of course, one of those great Canadian trays. Um, and you have to ask yourself, though, I mean, was that just so way over the top? And actually, are we here in Toronto at, at ground zero? Of, uh, of a clash of civilizations that Samuel Huntington, the Harvard professor, uh, wrote a book about 20 years ago. You know, are we, are we sleepwalking our way to Armageddon, where it'll just be the war of all against all? Are we becoming a city of solitudes, different cultural groups, retreating into ethnic enclaves or ghettos? Uh, why, because they want to, or because of discrimination and racism, poverty. Is diversity really our strength, as the motto proclaims, or is it, is it a weakness? Of course, you know three quarters of people living in the GTA are first or second generation immigrants. 47% in Toronto are visible minorities, and visible minority defined by Stats Canada famously excludes Aboriginal people. I never was able to figure that out. So in fact, we're probably a majority of minorities. Um, but if, if diversity, in fact, is a strength, then I think we're, I, I'd go public and, and, and start raising money because if, if we all then 
are uh, going to be so successful with diversity of such a strength, and that this place is going to be the greatest city on the planet. Everyone will recognize it. But if we're not, and it's going to be the war of all against all, then we're, not, we're going to be the canary in the mine on the bottom of the birdcage. Um, and then everybody else better watch out. Um, diversity covers a lot of dimensions. It's beyond multiculturalism, it's ethnicity, religion, migration status, Aboriginal identity, gender, sexuality. It's a long list and, and the list is probably going to grow. It will not get shorter. Um, I don't have enough time to discuss how all these groups are doing, statistically speaking, uh, or how they're perceived by a random sample of Canadians. Um, in fact, we've, we're even losing some data in this country. Um, there is a increasing difficulty uh, to have empirical facts about the kinds of things that we'd want to know are going on. Um, Stats Canada being cut back, National Household Survey is 68% response rate, the 32 who didn't are the people we need to hear from. Uh, our Prime Minister says this would be committing sociology. <laughs> I've been committing sociology since uh, kindergarten. And I'm going to continue to commit sociology even if they make it illegal. I actually wonder what the mandatory minimum will be, Wendy, if, uh, if it's actually put in the criminal code. It's, uh, it's an offense. In the meantime, um, I can't give you a totally comprehensive picture. I can tell you that we are not, in spite of my cheeky title, a utopia. We haven't got perfect equality. Uh, we don't have perfect inclusion. We have, however, come a long way since the Chinese head tax, since the internment of the Japanese Canadians during World War II that ultimately gave us the, this wonderful foundation that's our host tonight, the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. We've come a heck of a long way since none is too many, which was our policy about Jews fleeing Europe in the 1930s, and we don't have anti-Semitic riots in Christie Pitts anymore. I'd like to say we've come a long way since the last Indian First Nations residential school was closed in 1996, but that would be overstating it. The history of racism, prejudice, discrimination in this country runs deep and its eradication is very much a work in progress. But it's a work in progress. Where's my note here? So there's some progress. The official policy of multiculturalism and recognition of, as diversity, uh, of diversity as our strength are aspirational values of the Canadians. They're not realities manifested in every aspect of social or economic life, but the fact that they are among our most widely held aspirations is noteworthy. And after all, the, the word multiculturalism in Europe, in most countries, is a bad word. Although Canadians fall short of their expressed ideals around diversity, these ideals now comprise an integral part of the Canadian identity. When we survey people about Canadian symbols, multiculturalism ranks right up there with hockey. Here in Toronto, given the way the Leafs are playing, <laughs> multiculturalism is probably ahead of hockey. <laughs> When it comes to the perception of immigrants, Canadians are much more likely to see foreign-born as contributing to the Canadian economy. They help the economy grow. They don't take jobs away from other Canadians or ones who are native Canadians. Uh, they reject the myth that immigrants are more likely than the Canadian-born to be committing crime. These numbers are very different than you get in other countries. Now, these Attitudes, of course, are not universally held, but they are majority views, and they've been majority views for at least the last 10 or 15 years in Canada. We may underwent a big change in the 1990s. And let me tell you, this, the attitudes do stand out from what you find in Europe 
and in the United States. There is one point, however, that causes the Canadians a lot of anxiety about multiculturalism, about immigration. And it's a question we've been putting for a long time, and they're concerned about the speed with which new Canadians are adopting Canadian values. So what are these Canadian values that they're talking about? Well, we didn't probe it, but in having done research for 30 or 40 years, I think what we're talking about is newcomers' acceptance of gender equality and of social diversity. And we want it to happen or seen to be happen more quickly. Now we've got a quarter of a million people coming here every year and asking them to integrate overnight is asking a lot. Previous waves over the last two or three centuries took a lot longer to integrate into Canada than the current group is doing. In uh, practical areas of school and work, when you look at how immigrants and their children are doing, it's kind of a mixed bag of results. The OECD, the uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development does a thing every three years called the Program of International Student Assessment. I don't know, now it's 30, 40, 50, 70 countries. Uh, measuring how kids do in literacy and numeracy and so on. Canadian immigrants and, sec and, and uh, first generation, uh, first and second generation Canadian students outperform those who've been here three generations or more. <laughs> they may not have been all Protestants, but they sure brought the Protestant ethic, <laughs> right? Now, so educated, we've heard it also about kids doing well in school. But mom and dad aren't doing as well as they should be doing in, in the employment market. And we're bringing in people now who are better educated than previous waves of immigrants. So it's even more cloying. Um, Better educated people not getting jobs to the level that their qualifications uh, suggest they should get. The doctor driving a taxi is a reality. I met him the other day in Calgary. And he is not alone, nor is his wife. Efforts are underway to speed the recognition of foreign credentials. A lot of these are provincial uh, jurisdiction. Uh, efforts to help newcomers connect into professional Networks, TRIAC was referred to earlier, trying to break barriers to uh, employment for the thousands of educated, motivated people who arrive here each year. Another work in progress with a long way to go. When it comes to civic engagement, Canada leads the world in the proportion of immigrants who become citizens. It's after about 10, 15 years, it's about 80 to 90 percent. It's double the next country, Australia, which is 45 percent. 13 percent of our House of Commons is made up of immigrants, people who came here, found a house, got their kids in school, got a job, joined a political party, got nominated by that party, and got elected by people of diverse backgrounds, 13 percent, 41 of the 308 MPs elected in 2011 are foreign born. No other country comes remotely close to those kinds of numbers. What parties are they members of? All parties. Every party has foreign born. One of them is 100% foreign born, the Green Leader. <laughs> she was born in the States, a buddy of Bill Clinton. Um, but they also join the Conservative Party. Do you want to name the countries you know where the most conservative or right-wing party attracts immigrants? <laughs> Have a little trip in Europe and find out how many people are, immigrants are joining the National Party in France, and I could go on and on. They even join the Bloc Québécois. Immigrants come to Canada and feel confident enough to join a party that wants to bust up the country. Only in Canada would we actually, that, would that be something that, that could happen. Here in Toronto, the diversity of our city's leadership is lagging badly. Wendy gave numbers on this too. It's just almost astounding. Last municipal election. We have half visible minorities, and let me tell you, 
City Council looks more like the Legion Hall up in my hometown of Walkerton than it looks like the subway or, um, or a classroom at Ryerson. Candidates of color, including mayoral candidate Olivia Chow, encountered overt racism on a campaign trail. It was outrageous. A range of initiatives are underway to promote greater diversity in our civic life, but certainly this last election is not one to be cheering about. Finally, I just want to end by giving you a brief glimpse. I'm kind of a half empty, half full glass that I'm serving up here this evening. Um, numbers that are not about the economy, not about political life or public attitudes. It's about private life. Indeed, it's about love. I actually did write a book called Sex in the Snow, so I know all about this subject. In 1991, 2.6% of Canadian couples were mixed unions. That's somebody, you know, somebody is outside, uh, marrying somebody outside your own visible minority group. Same sex or opposite sex marriage are included, married or common law. So 1991, 2.6%. 2001, 3.1%. 2011, 4.6% mixed unions. Now these are small proportions, but the trend is gaining steam. And among people in cities and people who are better educated and who are younger, the numbers are higher. 8.2% of young people are in mixed unions, or of 8.2% of people in Toronto are in mixed unions, and among young people, it's triple that number, nearly a quarter. Um, I don't know what could be a better example of integration than, people, than mixed unions. And presumably, sooner or later, they're gonna have kids. And then we're gonna see, obviously, that integration is working, because it'll seem common, and uh, it'll be a very visible minority. So my point isn't that we'll someday live in a beige society, free of all injustice. My point is, once again, simply, that we've come a very long way from the xenophobic days of my childhood when a Catholic and a Protestant getting married in Bruce County was an outrage for both families. And an Irishman couldn't get a job at City Hall. I'm sometimes told that my optimism is over the top. It's not in any way my intention to diminish the realities of discrimination, inequality that exists in our society today, but I do believe diversity is our strength. Uh, it is important to be honest about what's not working, but it also must be honest about what is working. We must learn from both to have a platform for making sound decisions about our road together into the future. Thank you. There we go, glass half empty or glass half full. What a great way to end it on the topic of love. Uh, we live in a great city and a lot of people come here because it's so much better than some other places in the world. But better doesn't always mean good. And we have a road of work ahead of us to actually get to that space. And I think maybe that's a good place to start off with, with a discussion with our panelists. And as I was listening to them, I was reminded about uh, what's going on in the city. And in one respect, we have a declining birth rate and an aging population. We're not making babies fast enough. So immigration, newcomers, much as our past, will be the way forward. And we're leaders in a number of things. And, and maybe, Wendy, I'll ask you first to kick off the conversation. Does Toronto have what it takes to be a leader in inclusion? Um. I think, building a bit on what Michael says, I think Toronto is recognized globally as a leader, but I think your point that we still have a long ways to go is also true. And again, um, my colleague Ratten is here, she does the global cities of migration. I think there really is nowhere else in the world that is viewed as successful as, as Toronto, um, on these issues, but again, recognizing what we've heard, there are, there are still big gaps. So for sure, Toronto has what it takes. Do we have what it takes, 
not just to be one of the best cities, but to be the city we all dream of is, of course, another question. And I think that's where um, collaborative, integrative approaches that recognize the gaps as well as the successes are, are very important. Nation, how about yourself? You spoke very passionately about inclusion. But do we have what it takes in Toronto to really make some progress on that? I, the short answer is yes. You know, I, I read something recently, just today at work, and I'm not sure whose words these are, but I'd love to share it, is that a city is not gauged by its length and width, but by the broadness of its vision and the height, and the height of its dreams. We have a lot of examples of very committed leaders at the political level, at the educational level, in labor, employers who are leaders in um, advancing uh, uh, or progressing in this question of diversity and inclusion. Um, I think that we have to be mindful that the issues in, in the 21st century, um, local issues are further perpetuated by global issues. So what young people are feeling in very real terms on the streets of Toronto is further perpetuated by what they can access on the internet in a second, um, halfway around the world. And so we are up against, although we are talking about Toronto, rightfully so, I would suggest for the purpose of this conversation that the 21st century has moved our consciousness beyond just a local conversation because young people are identifying with what their peers are experiencing across the world. And I would say that we have enough evidence that there, while Toronto should be celebrated for a, a, a fantastic and welcoming city that has made progress, um, the issues that young people can identify with, whether it is because of the same faith, um, same racial background, and the, the, the injustices that they see their peers facing and their communities facing, um, leaves us in a, in a very precarious place to, to not ignore that sense of vulnerability amongst um, our young people, if indeed they are the barometer of our progress. Michael, I'm gonna ask you to answer the first question, then I'm gonna come right back with you to the second question. Okay. Um, I'm not as optimistic as uh, my two colleagues here on uh, Toronto, um, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> we have a wonderfully educated population. Uh, we have, um, we have downtown is doing very well. Exurbs are doing very well. Suburbs are not doing so well. Trends towards income inequality are happening here, certainly happening in the States. Uh, if we keep evolving the way we're going, um, we have a vulnerability to racialized poverty. And if that happens, and then, then you can start developing stereotypes, and it's the majority looking at the minorities, the minorities looking at themselves, and self-stereotyping. And one of the problems with Toronto is, is that we don't have the autonomy and the taxation autonomy to be able to do the kinds of things that can redress things like radical uh, income inequality. So we need to have partners, uh, Ontario, the federal government, uh, other big cities, you know, Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver, and so on. Um, we're gonna need some changes in order to be able to not sleepwalk our way into a very, very divided city. Uh, and again, not just on the basis of socioeconomic status, which is highly correlated with a lot of these discriminations that we've been talking about, so I would say that it's, this is not just a conversation for Toronto, Rahul, it's a, it's a conversation for Canada. And, and our big cities uh, are gonna need more than just infrastructure grants. We're gonna, need, we're gonna need money that helps us deal with social problems. And uh, so, I don't know, glass half empty so or the not, solution I'm saying we got a challenge. So it's in governance again, we're back. It's a governance again. issue and it's, uh, you know, we, our mayor, you know, when we want to do something, we got to go cap in hand to Queens Park or up to Ottawa. Um, and I, I think we should have more autonomy and controlling our destiny in order to deal with issues like this. So let me build on the second question. I'd like to get the panel's response to this as well. It's around social capital. 
So there are certain authors out there who studied social capital and they'd suggest that uh, social capital is diminished by diversity. Now, that would be very problematic for the future of Toronto and we've spoken about this often and we think that that situation is not Canadian and it's not a Toronto situation. So would you like to comment a little bit about diversity and social capital and maybe what we need to do to build more social capital in our city? Well, those of you here, all you students, of course, have read Robert Putnam and Bowling Alone and so on. And he basically, the great Harvard political scientist, said in a diverse society, in a, in a multicultural society, you get diminishing commitment to collective insurance policies like Medicare and other kinds of things where we're all going in the same pool because we're of such different backgrounds, we don't believe in the common good anymore. We kind of, it's every man for himself or every group for himself. And that's the kind of things that Robert Putnam was finding about the United States. And those of you who are watching about, watching the way things are going in the United States, they're self-selecting into communities of people just like themselves. Gated communities, those are voluntary. And then there are people living in ghettos. They're not there voluntarily. They're there because they're being excluded. So a research was done by academics about 13 years ago uh, looking at Canada and whether or not there was diminished social capital as a result of, of multiculturalism. And they found that the answer is generally no, that, that we still have trust, we still believe in collective programs like Medicare and public education and so on. Although this did lead me to wonder whether or not 13 years later, uh, given the way that Toronto has changed, is this something that we might want to look at in this city? So then I approached Rahul and we will be beginning a study on the study of social capital. Social capital is bonding with your own group and it's bridging with other groups. To just bond with your own group is not enough. You then have to bridge with other groups and there has to be trust. Trust in your neighbor, trust in your counselor, and trust in the police, trust in institutions. So I think, Rahul, sometime in the next six months to a year, in your vital signs report, you'll be able to report to Toronto, to Torontonians through, uh, through your annual vital signs and, and, and the report will come out of, to, to find out the extent to which we still trust and get along and, to gra and do great things with each other. And that's, uh, again, a question. Do we have that? Um, we hope so. We have a good platform. Let's make sure that, uh, that we continue. Right. Wendy, I see you shaking your head or nodding your head a lot on that. Yeah, I think the um, uh, we're working on a project with uh, Peel Region looking at social mobility among, among immigrants. And so I've looked at some of the literature recently. And what's really encouraging is that Canada has one of the highest rates of social mobility of any country in the world. And by that I mean that the uh, educational the education and the income of your parents is not a predictor of your education or income, which means that someone who works hard can actually, and gets good education, can actually be successful. And of course we know that racialization plays into this. Of course we know, as I, you know, my example um, suggested, that some people grow up with a lot more social capital than others. A, a kid growing up, with a parent who's a taxi driver and new to, to Canada is going to have less chance to even understand how to get into law school than my kid who will have you know, letters of reference from two former justice ministers. So we have to really recognize that social capital is not just something that is sort of theoretical and exists in, at, a, at a kind of macroeconomic level or at the community level or even at the fa family level, we have to look at ways in which to help individuals develop their social capital. And that's something that I think education institutions are particularly committed to doing. Nation, would you care to weigh in on this? Absolutely. I think that, um, I think social capital is essential and I think diversity is a way in which to foster social capital. Um, I think we have great examples where uh, mentorship is utilized. So Michael talked a bit uh, about the significance of um, um, bridging capital 
um, and bridging relationships. And I think that efforts like the ones that have been uh, developed by TRIAC and other organizations, Civic Action has come out with a recent recommendation to the province to develop a regional mentorship program for young people because it recognized the significance of those relationships to bridge beyond the limitations of your, com uh, of, of your community. Um, and to, to create open doors into, into opportunities that may be out beyond your community. Um, so I think we have examples where there, there are organizations um, look, addressing the issue of bridging capital um, or bridging relationships to foster greater social capital. Um, and I do believe that um, you know, if Torontonians were polled, Despite the challenges we have as a city, I, I would echo that there is still a great sense of trust within this community and uh, within, within our city and a great sense of possibility and we can't undermine that asset um, as, a, as, as, as a city. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm mindful of the time and we certainly want to include the audience and uh, a Q&A for some questions for our panelists. Uh, knowing that we would have a, a typical Torontonian shy and retiring group of people, we have volunteered some people to ask some questions to get the ball rolling. So I'd ask uh, Donna Kwan, I think Donna have from the TDSB, Donna had a question? Sure, that'd be great. You're welcome to come. Thank you, I'll just do this quickly sure. then. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I find that uh, such a forum is so inspiring to be able to have the conversations, to be able to uh, hear from three key leaders and three organizations here. And my question centers around the fact that, Wendy, you mentioned uh, that what factors have helped women and visible minorities succeed? And can they succeed in spite of barriers? You also talked about social mobility. Nation, you talked about a cultural shift and that um, this it was not, you know, when we talk about diversity, it's not anti-oppression or anti-racism, and that building capacity, we have a very long way to go. I really like what uh, Michael said in terms of uh, social capital and bonding and bridging with others and other groups. My question to the three of you, um, and anyone can answer is, do you feel we can leverage community assets as part of establishing models of inclusion? What might those community assets be in relation to models of inclusion for Toronto and Canada? Michael, care to kick that off? Yeah, I, I uh, have often been sad when we've surveyed the Canadians about the great institutions of our country and the symbols of Canadian unity and the success of the country, uh, that so rarely do the Canadians refer to public education. Mm -hmm. They talk about Medicare, they talk about the flag or hockey or whatever. And when I read, and Wendy will, uh, she, she knows about this as well because in, study, in, in the work she's doing with Peel, and the academics taking a look at things like social mobility in the United States and the ability for a poor person to, be, to move up from the socioeconomic status of their parent. The great escalator in Canadian society is this fabulous system of public education. Now, I don't want to put down our friends in the United States, but 100, 150 years ago, the dream of public education in America was the aspiration to level out society and giving everybody a chance to get ahead. And sadly, and I'm really upset about this, America's lost that capacity to use its public education system as, a, as, a, as an escalator to take people from the bottom mm -hmm. up to the middle class and higher. Miles Korak, an academic, at, at, has done research on social mobility, and again, Wendy referred to it as well. And uh, I would say then, Donna, I don't know whether you have any interest in the fact that I'm saying something good about the public education system, but, and I don't want to put down the Americans, but if you look at Toronto and you look at Chicago, and you look at public schools, and you look at the neighborhoods they come from, you can, there are public schools in Chicago that are close to private schools. 
because the neighborhood supports them. And there are public schools in Chicago that look more like prisons. Now, it's not all your fault, Donna, but Toronto has got a system, and you look at our public elementary schools and our, and our high schools, in which, and you can explain how this works, as I'm, you know, I don't exactly know how it works, where we can have first class teachers in a neighborhood with the poorest people. And we can, and, and as good teachers, as you'll find in the richest neighborhoods, in our public education system, 92% of kids go to public school. Only 8% are private, 4% are for rich kids, and 4% are, are religious. So this, 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 this system of public education, uh, to me, is the most important institution in our city for ensuring that you know, that, that we have a quality of opportunity and everybody has a chance for excellent education. And in areas that are challenged, we have programs like Pathways to Education, which is a model for the country. So I'm starting to be glass half full here, uh, but you have reminded me, I know in the papers lately, we are not hearing all as the good news about the Board of Education, but in spite of what that, the real story, is the astounding success. Now, we can do better uh, of this system of public education. Um, so I, that, to me, that's the back. Public libraries. We have the best public library system on the continent. Who knows about that? It's, it's astounding, that system. Go into a public library and see all those kids who may, maybe don't have enough room at home to do their studies. They go to our libraries and they work there. So you look at the public infrastructure here, Libraries, schools, public transit, that backbone, these will all be, one, uh, parks will all be uh, escalators for social mobility and ultimately in quality and inclusion. Was so that a speech by somebody who wants was, to run for office? Or? That's great. You're in the right place, Michael, if that's what you're planning. <laughs> but let me bring that back and pull a thread of that question and answer into something that uh, Wendy spoke about a little bit earlier. And that was on your slide about stories of success. And the uh, solution or the, the uh, end of that in your phrase was becoming the leaders of tomorrow. What do we need to be thinking about through education, the inclusion lens, for making sure that there is in fact a pathway from stories of success to leaders of tomorrow? So I think uh, I would echo everything that, that Michael, Michael says. I, I'll focus on things that I think we could be doing better. Um, I think if you look at, for example, the jobs without people, people without jobs issue, um, our youth do not have equal opportunities in spite of the great public um, education system because there are such disparities in what they know about uh, the opportunities and the choices and so on. And if you look at the transformational impact, for example, of electing uh, Barack Obama in the United States in terms of a whole generation of young people finally seeing, you know, someone of African descent could lead the arguably most powerful country in the world. I think we do have to pay attention to issues around media representation, role models, the stories of success that we tell, and in ways that resonate with young people, you know. I get invited and I go into the classroom on a regular basis, but I'm kind of old and boring and look like their grandmother. I mean, one of the things that we think is really useful is if you um, mobilize, for example, university students to work with high school students. Pathways to Education is a fabulous example, but there's more that we could be doing to leveraging those assets in order to, to help uh, young people see what their opportunities are. We did a thing on, uh, on um, uh, black leaders, and it was primarily an adult group. And um, I remember one of the mothers coming up to me in tears and saying, why can't you take this on the road to my son's school so he can see what the opportunities are? So I do think there's more we can do in showing young people that 
you know, the best route to success is not sports or being, uh, you know, assistant to a celebrity, which is what most 14 year olds think today. The schools are, are over tapped in terms of their ability to provide the kind of guidance, counseling or support. This is a really good opportunity for partnerships between post-secondary business, government and so on to help young people see what the opportunities are for them. Nation, I'm guessing you might have some views on youth and how they can be optimistic about their future. Um, I think, so I think that um, both Wendy and Michael have laid it out. Um, uh, I would bring a different perspective on some of what has been said. Um, I do agree, you know, certainly in our research, um, there are three critical factors for success to, to Donna's question. What are the factors for success? Education certainly is one of them. Skills that go beyond technical skills, but what folks are referring to as soft skills, like the ability to socialize, create relationships, um, and um, relationships. That those are the critical success factors um, that, that lead to success for, uh, in this case, young people who are, who are who are marginalized. Um, I would suggest that our education system, while there's a lot to be celebrated, there's a, we still have, um, as most recent data has demonstrated, 50% um, Latino youth who are not graduating, um, all, over 40% English-speaking Caribbean youth who are not graduating, um, over 40-something percent of young people coming from single-parent families, this is the intersectionality, mm -hmm. so we can cut it across, race, so on and so forth, are not graduating. So that's unacceptable. Um, and I know that we have a system where we have wonderful, wonderful teachers, administrators, faculty. The system is challenged, right? And it's a, it's a complex problem that, require, that, that has no silver bullet and, and requires um, labor to be at the table, it requires administrators to be at the table, and it requires our public figures to be at the table to look at how we bring, an, an, I don't know if it's 17th century or 16th century educational system into the 21st century. Um, this is critical. And if, if the future, and I do, agree with, I do agree with Michael, if the future and mobility, social mobility hinges on education, then the urgency of revamping, re revisiting our education system and looking at who is not finding success um, within that education. The correlation um, with a history of racism and oppression cannot be ignored. Um, so I think that there are enough red flags to tell us that um, if, our, if indeed we want a more diverse, inclusive community and education is a pillar of that diversity, then we need to, um, we need all the best minds to think of how we uh, bring our education system into the 21st century. Um, comment, um, I certainly celebrated uh, Barack Obama, Obama when he was elected. I would suggest today um, post that, that, that evidence demonstrates we do not live in a post-racialized society. And I would also suggest that although the color of the leader is representative of marginalized communities, the decision of that leader and that administration still reflects oppression. It still reflects um, uh, all sorts of isms and schisms and phobias that young people are seeing. And so it comes back to my point that diversity has to go beyond color. It has to go beyond numbers. It is indeed a deep cultural shift in understanding. So the day when our young people understand that equity and equality isn't just because I'm now sitting at the boardroom, it's because I'm sitting at the boardroom and I recognize that I have a social responsibility for those who are not sitting in the boardroom. Thank you. Now, I've been reminded about our firm stop at 8.30, so uh, for those who may have a question, uh, please come to the microphone there as I'm going to our next volunteer. Please come up to the mic here and we'll see if we can get to you. Our next volunteer is, in fact, Marina. Marina Nemet. Many of you might know her as a well-known author of The Prisoner of Tehran. We actually have a mic up here we can hand to you. She prefers that you go over there. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my many thanks to uh, the organizers and to the panelists. Um, I have been listening with a great deal of interest. Um, I'm no stranger when it comes to racism. Uh, I was born and raised in Iran, and uh, then after I escaped it, uh, I thought all was going to be well, but I ended up in Hungary right after the fall of communism. And people would swear at me on the subway in, in Budapest in 1991 and uh, call me a dirty gypsy. Why? Because I had dark hair. So that was definitely very educational for me. And I have to say that Canada is very special to me. Canada literally saved my life. So all of that said, I mean, uh, I definitely see the half full uh, part of the cup, but I also see the half empty part. And the panelists today, they spoke about the challenges that we face in this amazing country that we are blessed enough to live in. And I'm acknowledging from the bottom of my heart all the blessings that this country has given at least me and my family. I mean, um, and, and this gratitude is very, very sincere. But at the same time, yes, we heard the panelists, you know, we saw the graphs, we saw the numbers. Uh, I've been to many conferences and we hear about our problems. These are the problems, yes. We know that these are the problems. But the question here for me is, what are the practical steps? And by this, I don't mean in general. I don't mean in the sense of great, big, but vague ideas. But I mean the very practical steps, you know, in bullet point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What we can actually do to make things better. I'm very glad that we talked about the education system. That's very important. That's definitely a place to start. But again, being an immigrant myself, uh, I would love to hear uh, the panelists, uh, you know, each one of them, to at least give us one very practical, again, I'm not talking in academic terms, but I'm speaking in practical terms, what we can actually do to make things better. Let's go to the question. So one bullet each, one bullet point each. Michael. We did a survey of what it is to be a good Canadian citizen, volunteering. So you got kids, you take care of your kids. They're different. You treat them all equally, you treat them differently. If each of us, and we've got a bunch of aging baby boomers are looking for meaning in the rest of their life, they got another 10 or 20 years, right? I suggest that they maybe go back to their old high school. I suggest they look at their own neighborhoods and uh, figure out a way. The school board will help you. The Y will help you. The number of wonderful organizations call the Toronto Foundation that Rahul heads up and say, how can I help a kid? And kids, of course, impressionable, right? A 13-year-old, a 15-year-old. How many people tell us that somebody changed their life? A great high school student, a high school teacher. And it may well be that a volunteer going out, reaching out to a kid who's feeling very vulnerable and loving them and giving them advice and tutoring them may be that one practice. And if every Torontonian did that, wow, think of the capacity uh, that we have to help other people. Fantastic. Nation, what's top of your list? I don't know that it's very practical, to be very honest with you. But um, I go to this idea that, and I, I'll, I'll focus on the education system. I think that if we can embed in our curriculum within our young people at a very early stage critical thinking skills that allow young people to understand cultural biases and ability to analyze cultural biases at a, at a very early age, and young people are brilliant, I think that's the beginning of, ch of, of significant change in our community. Embed, embed cultural understanding and social analysis in our curriculum from elementary school all the way through to high school. Don't wait until post-secondary. It's too late. So we've got volunteering, critical thinking. Wendy? I like, uh, I like uh, both, what, uh, both the examples I heard before. Um, I would sort of build on Michael's and say, in addition to volunteering, I think that um, holding institutions and organizations accountable um, by, by really, and Nation may not like this, by really focusing 
on uh, results and outcomes and looking at, uh, at differences that should not exist, whether it's in the, the outcomes that we see of racialized kids, whether it's the progression we see of racialized workers, whether it's who is advertised, whether it's the images we're seeing in the newspaper and how different groups are being represented. I think, I, I think if people use their power as consumers, um, both as individuals and in the organizations that they represent. So when a big bank says we're committed to diversity, if they started to throw their weight around and make decisions about where they advertised and who they, which law firms they employed based on issues around representation, I think you'd get it mainstreamed much more quickly than um, using any amount of legislation, for example. So it's about doing things right as well as doing the right things. Absolutely. We have a question from the floor. Please introduce yourself first. Hi, my name is Jericho Biagi Went. Wonderful, you have a question. I do, I just wanna say something before I ask my question. If you make it short, we've got some folks behind you we'd like to get in as well. I sure will. The first thing I'm going to say is this. I know teachers who've been teaching for 20 years, their agenda or their curriculum has not changed one bit because they have a union that protects them. So no matter how much we talk about making critical thinking a priority or trying to incorporate technology, et cetera, into the classroom, they won't do it, no matter how hard you try. But the other thing I want to say is that, how do, or the question I have is, how do we get charter schools into our system? Any views on that question? I have no Michael? I, I don't no? know, I, I'd have to. Okay, Nation? I, I'm not sure, I, I don't have a concrete answer to, to the process to getting charter schools in the system. Wendy, any thoughts on that? Not on the charter school issue specifically, but simply on change. And I think that we do face constraints and in universities, um, you know, there are structures that prevent uh, innovation. But there are ways around that. And Elementary I think, school though. Well, regardless of the level, you can, st there still are schools which are very innovative, which have um, addressed these issues. And while it's not perfect, uh, I think thinking mindfully about change, what you want to achieve, having accountability frameworks, and looking at what the levers you do have to affect change is, is one way forward. Great, thank you. Next person, please. Baruch Friedman Cole, Toronto Board of Rabbis. What role does, do religious communities play in fostering diversity and in hindering diversity? Interesting question. Wendy, would you like to go first? I, I will comment on that because I think in light of uh, events in Paris, we've seen different people react in, in different ways. And I would say that um, what is critically important is for faith leaders to focus on what binds them together as opposed to what, what separates them. And so while, while a lot of people have uh, stood up and talked about the importance of freedom of speech, for example, Je suis char Charlie, um, I think that the people who have stood up and talked about the importance of respect and who have said Je suis Ahmed, um, from my point of view, have showed us how to maintain trust in a very difficult way. And there have been imams and rabbis and the Pope and many others who have really focused on promoting tolerance, mutual respect and understanding. And I think faith leaders can play an enormous role in uh, moving us forward, or as you said, they can play a big role in dividing us. Nation. I think brilliantly said, nothing more to add. I think absolutely faith leaders play a critical role and can be the beacons of um, thoughtfulness, um, the beacons of um, resisting um, extreme reactions um, and bringing groups together that when faith leaders stand up and demonstrate that there are still, that, that there are still relationships and respect across religions, I think it has a significant impact on the communities that adhere to those faiths. And I think it's critically important right now because there are enough forces pulling and dividing in multiple directions. 
Michael? Yeah, this is, I'm, I'm a bit nonplussed. I don't really know what to say because when I study the evolution of orientations to religion in this country, I'm seeing that one of the um, most significant trends of the last 50 years has been questioning religious authority, which often meant questioning patriarchy. And uh, so I come at it from a point of view that actually one of the great liberation movements of the last 50 years has actually been our ability to have freedom, not of religion, but from religion. But this sounds pretty provocative language. And I know that when I survey my American friends, they believe that you can't be a good person unless you believe in God. And when I survey my Canadian friends, they say somebody who believes in God and is a devout member of a religion, yikes. Uh, and, and so actually the attitude toward religion in Canada is among a very significant proportion, very negative. And the stories about, re so this is, a, this is way too long. The stories <laughs> about religion in Canada are the stories about residential schools and the stories about how religion actually was not an instrument of enlightenment, but rather an instrument of, of prejudice. So now we have clients who are in, uh, who are organized religion. We do a lot, and when I do my books, the people who seem to be most curious about how Canada's changing, about what it's like to empathize with someone else, are religious people. And, and so I go to the United Church, I go to the Angl Anglican Church, um, I go to the synagogue, and, and it's fact, in those places, I heard Abuleish, the guy I shall not hate, at uh, Holy Blossom. So it's interesting that a whole generation left the church. The ones who stayed seem to me are often spectacular people who are doing their utmost to try to get on with the program of inclusion, of, of trying to reach out to other people, doing interfaith dialogue and so on, whereas the vast majority of people hear about religion and they are saying, oh my God. So that is my little microcosm on on religion and and uh, and the Canadians, and uh, and I can say from my own personal experience, uh, religious people actually tend to be the ones who are the most liberal and tolerant in their attitudes. The ones who actually are going to the synagogues and the churches, and often the ones who aren't going to church have some of the worst attitudes. Uh, but religious leaders do need to speak up when we are we have, when we have issues. Uh, just as we see, you know, and, and it's difficult in, in churches like uh, Islam, it's decentralized, right? Okay, <laughs> right, all right. All right. So you got me under religion. Uh, exactly. Lorna Dueck is here, and she knows that I can have go a lovely on and on. <laughs> Folks, in the interest of time, I'm going to take two questions, and I promise Madeline Ziniak the last question here. So, sorry, gentlemen, but we can go to two and then one more. Please, if you wouldn't mind getting the question, that'd be great. Sure. My name is Anjan Manikumar, and... Um, I just like a question to the speakers. Basically, you, there was uh, there was talk about uh, two aspects of diversity, uh, but we did not really talk about a couple of aspects. The, the other aspect was sexual orientation, uh, diversity. Uh, I do see that a lot of numbers. Question, regard. please. Yes, um, so, and the other, the one more very important aspect, which was completely missed out, was disability. So I'd like to have your uh, views on diversity based on sexual orientation and disability. And I think to be truly diverse and truly all inclusive, these two have to be, are really important for us. Great, so we've got the question. Can I have one panelist that would care to take that on? Wendy. Uh, I'll um, take it on only because um, a lot of our research focuses on uh, racialization and gender in part because those are easier to measure. The issues around uh, disability and sexual orientation, critically important, but require really good survey research and high levels of self-disclosure, which remain problems. But you're absolutely right, and I think we all mentioned that we recognize that diversity has multiple um, faces, but thank you for raising those. Right. 
Sir, could you please introduce yourself, please? My name is Moses um, Mawa, and I'm actually from uh, Silver Trust Communications. So we publish Diversity Magazine, and copies are available upstairs. And your question? My main question, uh, the first one, I have three actually, brief just ones. Just one today, please? Could you choose just one today? Uh, I'd rather not say it. Thank you. Please, sir, it would be appreciated if you could stay for a question. I first of all want to say that I was specifically invited to be, um, to communicate, be um, people who would actually say specific things, you know, after the panel, and I just wanted to be able to express that view, because I think it would add a voice to the conversation. I know the time is limited, but um, I don't know. I'll ask one anyways. Thank you. Thank you. My... Uh, Point is, um, there has been conversation around uh, social capital and social diversity, which in my opinion really requires um, a higher degree of innovation and uh, the engagement of uh, particularly the youth. All right, and that's what is gonna actually help us to be able to achieve um, you know, uh, transformation. But um, what process do we have in the city that would enable us to have youth, particularly those from the periphery, to be able to have a voice that is actually communicated and that's also incorporated uh, for decision makers to be able to, you know, to take uh, the voices from the grassroots into account? Good question, Wendy? Or Nation, no, no, you want to go first? Nation, so, the youngest. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think that we have examples of um, movements like Diversity Fellows, um, led by uh, Metcalf and Civic Action, that are very intentional about fostering uh, youth, diverse youth leadership in the city of Toronto. Um, I think there's uh, across uh, the community service organizations that I work with uh, through United Way, um, there's, a, there's a shift in, 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 in valuing young people to be um, decision makers um, within their community. We look at the Building Strong Neighborhoods, um, the City of Toronto's Toronto Strong Neighborhoods um, strategy, uh, values, uh, community involvement, and young people within those communities as thought leaders, um, uh, ideators, if you will, and implementers of those ideas that affect their communities most. I think this is the way in which we um, identify and begin to cultivate leadership amongst young people. I'll go back to my point earlier. That's just the beginning. It is about building capacity for those young people to, uh, to actualize um, their, their potential, and then to build capacity within the organization and structures that welcome those young people um, to, to understand what it means to be a young person stepping into a leadership position, how to, how to go beyond the technical language that we often take for granted at boardrooms that would alienate mm -hmm. a young person. Um, those are just really small examples about when I, when I talk about building capacity. Um, so I, I think there is a movement uh, and there has been uh, uh, intentional efforts in this city to foster youth leadership um, and a recognition that youth voice, youth leadership is a key pillar of transformation in, the, in, the, in, in creating a more diverse and inclusive city. Either of the panelists or we should go to our last question. Okay, Madeline, I know you've made a career in working diversity in Toronto. You have the pleasure of the last question. Thank you. Um, the, the, it's, it's quite a disparity between corporate Canada, <clears throat> public and private sector, and I think it's no, it's no mistake that civic engagement is high because of the many, many organizations and volunteers in Canada who've be, who have been committed to diversity. It's also in this kind of economic uh, environment where it's tight, where economy perhaps is not that great. It's always diversity programs that are the first to be cut. How do we keep corporate accountability safe? How do we, we know that we've engaged public trust with corporate Canada, and how do we make them accountable? Because that's where all the work has to be done. Because many of us know that the old boys network still exists, and it's really in the leadership of corporations who will be choosing the leadership following, going further into the corporation. And we know also that that's lacking in media, and certainly as the media environment gets tighter, it's, it's those that are get, getting exited as well. And certainly those diversity programs, steering committees, executive committees are the first to be cut. So question is, 
how do we ha keep corporate Canada accountable to diversity? Wendy. What gets measured gets done. I think tracking, recognizing that the numbers are not the only issue, but I think tracking, transparency, and consumer activism, you know, people saying, I'm interested in working with a bank that has a female chair of the board rather than banks that uh, don't have female leadership and, you know, search and replace different diversity categories. But I really think that companies will respond to regulation, but they will respond to consumer activism even more, and that goes for the media. Nation? I, I, would, I would concur with Wendy. I think that um, corporate accountability at the end of the day is what, what affects my bottom line. Um, I think that uh, consumer, consumer um, power needs to be leveraged. Um, just to dispel, I do, think, <laughs> I do think measurement and accountability plays a significant role. I wouldn't want to dismiss that. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, not much more to add to what Wendy has already said. Michael, you spend a lot of time in the corporate world. Yeah, I do, asking for money for my foundations. <laughs> <laughs> but we also have a market research division, and let me tell you, they have a, a growing uh, multicultural diversity practice because large companies are saying, if we don't look like our customers, we're history. You can't be in, a, in this city with uh, three quarters, first or second generation, and not want to be, not want to be serving those uh, customers. And if you look like them, you're going to have a better chance in doing so. So they wrote a book called Migration Nation, and it's kind of a handbook to help companies make sure that they are sensitive to uh, immigrant groups, uh, second generation. How do we recruit these kids and get them into our company? And if we do it, we're going to beat the one who hires somebody's idiot nephew uh, <laughs> just because he's in the network and belongs to the golf club. I mean, still those, happening. Those, it's still happening. But let me tell you, if you you keep doing, if you go back to the Toronto of 50 years ago, where who you know was all you knew, uh, let me, you're, you're going to be gone. You're going to be like the dodo. You must start reflecting what this community is looking like, and and uh, and and they're they're doing it. Not all of them are doing it. The larger ones are doing it, and they're wanting to reflect those local uh, communities in all their background. Now, particularly the ones that are, you know, they, are, they really want to understand the Chinese, they really want to do the South Asians, they're going to have to reach out beyond those two large groups, who are the most obvious ones for them, and reach out to others. And then they've got to look at other kinds of diversity issues. So, sexuality, we've never seen a faster change in public attitudes mm -hmm. than the orientation uh, to gays and lesbians. In the last 15 years, it's like we went from the Dark Ages to, um, the, you know, th this is now normal and we, and we need to adapt to this. And there'll be other groups based on sexuality that we're going to have to adapt to. Harder ones maybe are going to be disabil uh, dis uh, disabilities, um, so that's going to require pushing as well as the, the pulling that's going to be done by the private forces. So we need both the kinds of things that Wendy does, report cards on things that hold up a mirror to our society, but market me mechanisms will be very strong as well. Thank you very much. So Toronto better, but lots of room for improvement. <laughs> Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for this evening. Thank you all for joining. And thank you all for your considered opinion. You're a part of a very important dialogue that's taking uh, uh, place across the country. Thank you so much for coming out on this chilly night. Um, if I can uh, just add, as uh, executive director of this organization, I thank everybody for coming out. Particularly, I have to thank our amazing moderator, round of applause to Raul, and of course, um, Wendy Nation, if I may go by the first names, Michael, thank you. To our audience, this is the beginning of the conversation. We'll be in touch with all of you uh, for your post evaluations. For those that didn't have the chance to ask the questions, the conversation is going to continue. Uh, check us out on uh, Twitter. Um, there will also be, as I say, an email with further information, LinkedIn. You all know the social media drill. Thank you so much, and let's keep this conversation going. <laughs>